So good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Wendy Wyatt, and I'm the chair of the communication, de communication and journalism department. And I recognize many of you, but not everyone. So welcome tonight. We're really pleased to have you here. And I am extra excited to have eight of our fabulous alumni here tonight to share with you some of their experiences, to talk about what they've done in their post-COJO, post-UST lives, um, to share advice with you, to answer your questions. We've got 90 minutes, and so I think we'll have some good time to get all of that done. We are videotaping tonight's performance, just so you know. So if you have a <laughs> tonight's performance, yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> The performance, right? You rehearsed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Carrie Jo's going to do her interpretive dance. Um, so if you have a question when we get to the Q&As, um, we'll make sure to get a mic to you so we can hear your questions on the, on the video. And then if all the panelists can remember to use a mic as well, that would be great. So let's kick it off. I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves and tell you who they are, what they're doing. We have their names up on the screen, so if you want to if you want to keep track of anyone in particular and find them afterward, you can do that. Um, but I thought we could just start with with just telling us what you're up to after after uh, UST, and maybe we'll start with Carrie Jo. Sure. My name is Carrie Jo Fallhaber. I am a 2010 graduate of St. Thomas. Uh, Carrie Jo Johnson to all of my classmates. Uh, that's my maiden name. Fallhaber is a little bit more difficult to pronounce. Um, Let's see, so I graduated in 2010, and right after college, I worked for Catholic Charities of St. Paul, Minneapolis. It's a local nonprofit in St. Paul, and um, I worked in their communications and um, marketing department doing all of their, you know, press releases and brochures and anything that a communications person at a nonprofit does, so kind of a little bit of everything. Um, Catholic Charities runs several different homeless shelters, different programs for people in poverty, so I was really involved in that. Um, while being there, um, a video production company named Storyteller um, came to Catholic Charities and did a video for us, and uh, broadcast journalism was my emphasis while I was here. I had every intention of being a reporter on TV. That's what I studied. That's what I worked at. I got out in the real world after an internship, and I said, no, thank you. Um, so while being at Catholic Charities, Storyteller uh, produced a video for a big event that we had going on. Uh, after the video production was over, I got a call asking um, to come to their office to be part of their team. I was not looking for the job. It just kind of fell into my lap. And lo and behold, it's become kind of the job um, that I always wanted when I was in college. I just never knew existed until I actually got out into the world, got experience, got to meet different people. Um, and that's, so that's where I'm at now. Um, I'm a video producer there. Um, so we produce video for local, small and medium-sized businesses, nonprofits, that kind of thing. Um, just this past fall, I was able to produce a video for Catholic Charities, um, which ended up winning an Upper Midwest Emmy Award, which was really fun. So yeah, big accomplishment. So thanks for coming tonight. And that's me. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Miles Trump. Can you hear me OK? My name's Miles Trump. Uh, I'm a 2011 graduate of St. Thomas, so one year after you, right, Gary Joe? And uh, I have not won an Emmy, so congratulations on that. Um, so I was more of a, I was in a kind of the print multimedia journalism track here. Those were my interests. And uh, after I graduated, I took one of the first jobs that I could possibly take. Uh, first, I think it was the first offer I got actually in Wapaton, North Dakota. Anyone heard of Wapaton or? Yeah? All right. Um, so there's not a lot in Wapaton, and, uh, but there are some decent stories out there. And I, I ended up staying there only for about a year. And I went to uh, cover sports at a weekly newspaper, which seems kind of a, a backwards jump to go from a daily to a weekly. But. Um, Sports are my interest, and so I went to the Wasika County News. Wasika, anyone? Yeah, okay. Um, and I went to the Wasika County News for about a year and a half, and after that, um, landed a job at the Faribault Daily News, which is a larger daily newspaper in the same company as the Wasika County News. And so I, I it was kind of strange and kind of peculiar. I went from three papers in like three and a half to four years, which I don't know if I would recommend that, but that was my track. Um, 
And then just recently, I ended up at 360 Journalism. Um, anyone heard of 360? I know there's at least two people. In okay, good. I, two of our 360 student workers are actually in the room right now. So, um, so what 360 is, it's a program of the College of Arts and Sciences here at St. Thomas. And it is a program that teaches journalism skills and college readiness skills to uh, high school teens. And they're, we're basically, our, our target demographic are students of color and students who are on free and reduced lunch. And it's a, a fantastic program. I actually got a chance to intern there when I was uh, around your guys' age, when I was here at St. Thomas. And I, I remember thinking, if I could ever work here, I would jump at the chance. Because um, journalism is obviously one of my passions, but youth as well, and just working and trying to help develop youth is a big passion of mine. And so that happened, and I've about three weeks in as program manager at 360, and it's been awesome so far, and I just can't wait to see what happens and where it goes. So glad to be here and hope to help answer some questions you guys might have. My name is Brian Gates, and uh, I work at the University of St. Thomas, which is the largest private college in the state of Minnesota. Um, you attend this institution. Um, I graduated in 2004, which makes me the oldest person on this panel. And uh, I've worked at St. Thomas ever since. I'm a little bit old school. I like, um, one of the things I loved about my degree was learning about advocacy and finding uh, a job where you could have work for something that you care about. And after my experience as an undergraduate, I knew I really, this place was very, very important to me. Um, so I was a journalism public, it was journalism major, not communications and journalism then, uh, journal, journalism public relations major, and I minored in media studies and American cultural studies, which is now American culture and difference. So my programs don't even exist anymore. Um, and I graduated in 2004, I've been here ever since. I was an admissions counselor for six years. So I traveled to high schools of some of the people actually on this panel and uh, shared my experience, which I think uh, was also a characteristic uh, that I picked up uh, in my journalism classes, being able to communicate my experience. Um, I was a full-time financial aid counselor for a year, uh, which is a really challenging job, uh, communicating the cost of an education like this. Um, during that time, I received my MBA from St. Thomas, taking evening courses. And for the last four years, I've been in a leadership role in our office. Um, we're the primary revenue driver uh, of the university. And we have 11 people uh, that are usually recent graduates uh, that are responsible for uh, not only counseling and talking to 18-year-olds about the independence that they're about to experience, but also uh, responsible for sales. And so uh, our job is a blend of a lot of different things from business uh, to communication and marketing pieces to um, being able to counsel one-on-one. -on -one. I love working in the field of education. Um, and that's where I ended up here. Hello, my name is Grant Gerke. I am a 2010 graduate of St. Thomas and I was a Kojo major. Um, during my time in law school, I think sometime my sophomore, junior year, I realized I wanted to go to law school. I really enjoyed writing and doing research projects, uh, as weird as that is, and uh, decided to go to uh, William Mitchell, which is just down the street. I like Summit Avenue that much. Um, and I went there directly after graduation and uh, took three years to graduate. And during that time, I did a bunch of different externships and uh, on-campus projects. I was on Law Review. I worked with some fe a federal district court judge, got to do some misdemeanor prosecutions up in the northern St. Paul suburbs, and uh, spent a year at the U.S. Attorney's Office working on a federal racketeering case against a Native American gang. And then after graduating in 2013, I went to uh, apply for a judicial clerkship at the Minnesota Court of Appeals and was lucky enough to secure that position. Um, so I started there in the fall of 2013, and then last year, it's just a one-year term, and last year uh, I had a judge invite me to stay on for another year, so I'm doing that right now. Um, and basically as a clerk, what you do is you work one-on-one -on -one with the judges and help them decide cases by 
reading all the briefs, doing some research, uh, drafting memorandum and uh, writing and drafting opinions for the judges as well. And you get to see a lot of different lawyers come in and make arguments and, and read arguments in a ton of different cases. So I'm getting a pretty broad exposure to the law and uh, I'm hoping to move on to a, a law firm or a prosecutor office this fall, but uh, that's still in the works for now. Hi, I'm Pauline. Is my microphone on? Yes, okay. I know, it's hard to tell. Um, I'm Pauline, I'm a 2011 graduate. I studied Kojo in college and my first experience ever in journalism was at St. Thomas. I told my very first story my freshman year. It was on the men's basketball team, Coach Fritz, winning his 500th win as head coach and I was hooked ever since, I loved it. Um, I had four internships in college. I interned at WCCO here in the Twin Cities. Then I went to CNN. Then I studied abroad in London and I interned at the Associated Press. And then I came back here for one final internship at Channel 12 News, which is very, very small, very local, if you know where that is. Um, I graduated. I took a job at the CBS affiliate in La Crosse, Wisconsin, where I was a general assignment reporter. So I worked nine to six, came in, got my story idea for the day, and I went out and I got my interviews, came back, I found my sound bites, I wrote my story, edited it all together, and had it ready for the five and six o'clock news. Spent two years there, and I loved it. Um, but I was looking for something just a little bit bigger, so I figured I'd try the other side of the state. So now I'm in Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> um, so right about now, it's about 6.15, which is if I were to be working tomorrow, I would be asleep at this point. I work the morning show now in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So the morning show runs from 5 to 9, and I do live segments now. Not so much stories. I do stories every now and then, edited stories, but now I do live segments. I have four live segments in the morning, about two and a half minutes apiece. Um, one each hour, and that's where I'm at. I'm about a year in, and I like it so far. So we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jess Snell. I'm a 2010 graduate of St. Thomas. I actually majored in marketing and had a minor in what was journalism with an emphasis in public relations. Um, and I'm also a minor in Spanish, so I don't tell a lot of people that when I ask them to speak it. Um, and I actually have a much shorter story um, than a lot of these folks here. I actually um, started interning at my current um, agency, Haberman, when I finished my junior year. So I'll actually be there six years come May, which is like kind of insane and unheard of in agency culture. Um, there's a bit more turnover, transition, people kind of bouncing around. We actually have a very, very dense agency market here in the Twin Cities. And so um, there's a, a lot of great agencies and it's not uncommon to kind of bump around every few years, but um, I love Haberman, it's my home. Um, I could go on and on about it, but just a little bit about kind of what we do. Um, we're a 50 person agency started by Fred and Sarah Haberman, a husband and wife team who 20 years ago kind of saw an opportunity to help tell the stories of pioneers making a difference in the world. And so that really remains our mission today and sort of our lens in terms of how we think about what clients we wanna work with. Um, we do have sort of an emphasis in the natural and organic food space, which is really awesome. So I work only on food brands. Um, and I'm on the account side, so I'm an account supervisor. My path was intern, account manager, um, and as of last year, account supervisor. So I'm on the account side, I work with clients, um, which can be both really fun and really challenging. Um, but I love it, and I um, love to the transition our agency has made since I've been there. We started our roots are much more in like communications, um, public relations side of things, and now we're a full service agency. So I oversee accounts that do everything from branding to website development to social media, public relations, events, um, influencer relations, kind of the whole mix, which is a lot of fun. So it kind of blends my background, I would say, at St. Thomas. Um, and yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, my name's Christine Tafe. Uh, looks like Taffy, but it's not. Is it on? Okay. Um, <laughs> I never needed mics in theater. So um, uh, I'm a 2012 graduate. Um, I was the first year of Kojo, uh, the inaugural Crystal Ray trip. Uh, it was awesome. And uh, with a minor in creative writing and literature. Um, I uh, picked the advertising track um, my sophomore year, and that's when I joined AdFed um, and NSAC, the National Student Advertising Competition. Um, which were both extremely formative um, in retrospect. <laughs> Didn't think it was at the time because who just goes off into a room and um, tries to pitch new business uh, with no information, but that's how new business pitches work. So uh, good to know. 
Uh, so those two clubs were really formative here um, for me, um, both in meeting people and uh, learning uh, about just meeting people in the industry and learning about what to do. Um, and I had a couple internships um, throughout college. Um, started at a digital agency as uh, kind of a fake intern. I patched a wall one day. It was for a month over J term, but that's kind of where I started seeding my um, network in the city. Um, and then, you know, after I, uh, while well, I was studying abroad in Prague, my junior year, that's when I um, found a communications department job at um, the Minnesota State Fair, and that's when I, um, like, digital and social started really com becoming a part of my life. Um, part of it was just my age and me liking to be on Twitter, but um, uh, that was the m most formal experience. And then uh, I actually joined Haberman um, as an intern, uh, part-time intern, my spring of my senior year, and uh, so that's where I met Jeff, got to work on all those lovely little organic food brands, uh, which was amazing, and I was hired after um, the summer, after I graduated in 2012. So um, I was there for two years, um, got to really get thrown into it. Uh, any kind of role in digital and social is um, extremely vague, <laughs> um, from the title to the job position to day-to-day -day work. It's, um, it's everything from, you know, writing tweets sometimes to higher level strategy work, um, mostly creative problem solving because no one knows what to do. Um, so kind of taking your best guesses and gut feelings and um, creating uh, hopefully solid strategy work in a good direction to go in no matter what the ask is. Um, but then uh, this a year ago I moved over to Fallon, another, another ad, ad agency on the other side of town. Um, and there I've, I've been doing similar work, digital strategy work, but um, have am kind of leading um, how to bridge social and digital into our traditional creative process, because Fallon's been around for quite a while, has some very storied work, um, and everyone's very willing to change, but um, kind of needs a direction. So that's that's what I do. I, I work on Talenti Gelato, um, Trivia Natural Sweetener, Loctite Glue, we just ran a Super Bowl spot. Um, so that was really fun to be a part of. And um, yeah, that's where I am now. Hi. Hi, my name is Brent Fisher, um, and my story is very similar to Grant's. Uh, both uh, 2010 graduates at St. Thomas. Um, I just sat, I decided pretty late on in my uh, journalism career, if you could call it that, um, that it wasn't for me, um, and went to law school. So I graduated from William Mitchell in 2014, um, and at my time at William Mitchell, did kind of various uh, externships and clinics. Um, one of which was at Medica, the health uh, insurance company here in Minnesota. Um, and then just graduated a little bit over a year ago. Um, now I'm working at a firm downtown called Near and Gear, uh, mostly doing civil litigation. Um, so civil court cases uh, ranging from like comp complex construction cases to uh, heavy machinery accidents um, and stuff of that nature. Um, so pretty new to the legal field. Um, but yeah, that's my story. Well, thanks. I'm always really um, amazed by the sort of range of things our, our grads are doing. And these eight folks represent part of that range. Um, not all of it, but I think a good sample. But I'm curious, just quick show of hands. How many of you are doing the kind of work right now that you imagined you were going to do when you walked into whoever's office to declare your major way back when? Okay, so a couple. but. <laughs> I mean, there have been journeys happening here, and I think sometimes students get, um, maybe there's anxiety or concern about, okay, what, what am I going to do when I graduate? And I need to know that right now, and I need to go on that path. Does anyone want to comment on your sort of journey and, and how you negotiated that, that journey? I mean, I'm in the first chair, so I guess I'll go first. <laughs> um, so kind of like I said, I started out as a broadcast journalism major, um, and a lot of what is taught in those classes are you go out with your camera, you get the story, you get the interviews, you come back, you sit down in the edit bay for hours at a time, all night long, you, you cut these stories um, day in and day out, ask Pauline, she does it all the time. And the more I did it, you know, it's like I love telling stories about people. I love people, and I love the written word, and I love visuals, so let's combine all that. Okay, I guess I'll be a reporter. Sure, that sounds great. Um, and then I had kind of this interest in sports, and um, I had a great internship locally here with Fox Sports North, 
And um, I remember I was doing live sideline reporting for a high school football game. It was Creighton Durham Hall versus Woodbury. And it was one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. I looked into the can. There, he gave me a script like six minutes before we went to air. And he said, this is what you're going to read. And it was pouring out rain. It was like 30 degrees outside. And he's in my ear going, okay, you're on. And I'm just... And I don't, I don't remember what I said. I watched the video and I'm like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this for, for a living. Um, and it was just a different, it was a different world than I thought it was going to be. It's not what you see on TV. It's, it's much deeper. Um, it's much deeper than that. So, I always knew that my true passion was telling visual stories um, and really bringing people's stories to life. And um, doing that through video is um, something that you cannot do with a written word. Um, or with a photograph. A video is supposed to take you somewhere. Um, and so I, I kind of tried to follow that passion and find that in whatever way I could. Um, and I knew that TV was not the direction that I wanted to, to, to take, even though that's kind of what they really enforced here a lot. And, but I was able to take something out of it, at least, and say, you know what, I'll, 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 I'll take these fundamentals and I'll find something else with it. I'll, I'll apply it someplace else. And I have. Now, as a video producer at Storyteller, my job is to find those stories, to um, work with our different clients, to go out and interview somebody. And really, I go through the scripts just like a reporter does. I log all of the sound bites. I put these scripts together. I, I put inspirational music behind it. And I really tell these stories, these untold stories um, for these businesses and nonprofits. And, um, and so I'm able to kind of bring that through, but not in the traditional way that sitting in the classroom here, I ever really thought I could. So. Anybody else want to say anything about the, the journey to getting where you are? Um, I think when I was in college, I, I thought that finding a job was something I'd just pick and choose. But much like the college search process, it's more of a process of elimination. It's more of trying things and realizing that's not what I was going to do. Um, than it was just something falling in my lap. And so um, the young me thought it was, I was just gonna pick it and that's what I was gonna love. But it was more of, try and that's why the liberal arts can be very beneficial. Um, but trying different things and saying, okay, that's not my vibe. You know, I can, I can cut my search in half by knowing I like education and I can focus on education. So I think it's, I would have told myself to uh, focus more on narrowing my search rather than trying to figure it out because that's really stressful um so that's i guess that's what yeah i would i would add to that that um you know like a lot of people i think have already said you know a lot of jobs that exist out there are a little bit hard to imagine when you're in school and so the best thing that um i was told actually in prsa which i was very involved in here and it became very formative for me was um, to just try a lot of different things to sort of eliminate one at a time. So whether that's different types of roles, I had internships at nonprofits, I worked at a corporation, then ended up having that agency experience. So then I could really, even just the environment, um, understand what was the best fit and the best energy for me personally. Um, and so I think that's another big piece with it is just trying to like put yourself in those different situations and then really just be curious when you're in those roles. Like you're going to have a list of things that are your assignments, but to really like listen and get some exposure to like other people and what they're doing um, around you, because that again helps just kind of say like, oh, I'm more curious about that than what I'm currently doing. Like, let me look into that. Um, and so it's really just trying to be like super attentive to kind of everything that's happening around you, so that you can narrow in. But Uno más. Um, a little bit of Spanish for you, Jess. Uh, <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I guess similar to what Jess said, I think um, I didn't really think about going into advertising because I guess I had no information. Um, I didn't come from a family that was, you know, connected to it in any way. Um, and it, it really, like, I, I spent all freshman year kind of, like, you know, interested in PRSSA and AdFed and, like, I was on their email list, but I didn't really know um, what to do, mainly because I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what it was. Um, and so joining AdFed um, immediately gave me such a, a one-up on like everybody else because it was um, when they bring actual people who work in these jobs uh, it gives you such a better understanding of, of what the heck they're talking about especially in Purdue's class when we go through all the flowcharts of an agency 
Um, uh, Because, I mean, what's an account executive? Sounds, like, super important, but you know what? Actually, most of them are 19. So it's like, well, yeah, not supervisor. Like, (laughs) you're older and much more experienced. Um, So, I mean, it just, it gave me such a a handle on what the world was. Um, And then that's when I started to pick up on, like, oh, okay, they're talking, when they would present, it was like, oh, they're into, they're in more of a creative role or it's actually a creative hybrid with strategy or whatever. And it started to let me not only understand the world, but kind of piece together what I wanted to do. Um, and I've kind of um, got to do that because it's a wild, wild world. So it's been exciting. So I know that um, out-of-class experiences are, are really important for people in Kojo, and we're going to talk about those in a minute. But I'm interested in sort of in-class experiences, ideas that you gained in your classes, particular skills that you gained that have been really important to you in your work um, post-UST? I'll start. Um, actually, my I think one of my most formative classes was our capstone um, ethics uh, with Dr. Bunton was my teacher. Um, I heard all the teachers were great, though. Um, so uh, it, it, it really gave... Um, some of the most real world applications on, even though like it, it wasn't journalism um, specific, it was like, how, how do you live your life and do your work ethically? And what does that mean outside of like just textbook experience? I, I think we got so many um, awesome uh, real life applications like um, in the ethics bowl, which um, I guess, is that happening or soon? Yeah, soon. Oh, <laughs> uh, it was, uh, I have used, so many of those um, ways of thinking in a lot of what I've done. Um, I, I think th- in this th- when things you see in the news and how you react to them, like especially through a brand voice, um, you have to take that um, into account. And I, I just feel like that was a really special part of my education. Uh, one of the, the best things that I learned here uh, in Kojo was just how to write proficiently. My first year of law school, the thing people struggled with the most was how to organize uh, research papers and briefs and how to answer essay exams and organize those in a way that gets your point across. So taking editing with Paul Clouda, um, all my courses where I had to write research papers um, and learn how to take a ton of information and reduce it down and present it in the most proficient way possible was excellent. And I also took a few um, argumentation and persuasion classes that were great. Um, Not only did they prepare me for ethics bowl someday, uh, hopefully eventually I'll be in the courtroom and be able to rely on those skills as well. I would just add to the writing piece, like I cannot underscore that enough. And I'm sure, I mean, everybody in some form or fashion, but certainly in the account role, I'm writing briefs regularly. Um, I'm preparing presentations. And so just that practice of being up in a room and, being able to articulate yourself and um, kind of have that confidence. So just, and even in a deck, you know, putting together an organized persuasive sort of story, um, you know, writing proposals, um, email, like just email etiquette and writing emails. I mean, there was a lot of um, just that even incorporated. All the writing stuff is just like, if I could go back and get another degree, I would do English or any just writing um, because it's just such a huge part of, I think, really any professional role. Yeah, I would just piggyback off that, too. Um, I know at 360, we talk about writing as being really a transferable skill to all of these professions. And for me, I was I was really interested in reporting, um, even though I didn't quite have a handle on what it was yet. And reporting was like Stuart Scott on SportsCenter. That was my idea of it. Um, but when I took my initial intro to reporting class, I don't, uh, it was... Professor Vandegrift and Nugel, who taught it. And that not only gave me a taste of what reporting was and what good reporting looked like, but it also helped me just learn how to communicate with people, uh, to go places with a video camera lugged around and learn how to interview and talk to people. And um, like Grant was saying, learning how to just write professionally, punctually, concisely. And that really, I guess, put the put things in motion, got the ball rolling for me. Uh, editing was another great class. I've learned so many things that I have never forgotten that are just seared into my mind from that class. And uh, that one definitely stuck with me. And I, I think that's beneficial 
for anyone in any profession. It'd be great to have an editing class of some sort. So, and just to give one uh, precise example, so the whole Court of Appeals today, you know, 14 judges and all their law clerks, some judges that have been writing for years and years, uh, came to a presentation this morning, and it was an editor of the Minnesota Lawyer, which is a newspaper, a weekly newspaper that reports on the courts. Um, and got to learn what a lead paragraph is, what a nut graph is, um, and how you, what the reverse pyramid method of reporting is. Um, so everything I learned, you know, to, you know, however many years ago, and in my reporting classes, uh, all the judges were learning again today. That first time you send out a marketing piece to thirty thousand people, and you're worried that something's in the wrong place. That confidence was built up a long time ago. So, One thing I want to add, my senior year, um, I took the very same class um, with Vandegrift and Nugel. So a guy coming from years and years in television news and a guy coming from years and years in print news. And it was interesting to see them debate about certain things. Well, this is the way you do it. No, this is the way you do it. And as a student, you're thinking, okay, how different can they really be? It's all news. It's all writing. It's all storytelling. But they're coming from two different worlds. And then you bring in... With the merge of communication and journalism, you're bringing in the world of public relations and writing for a press release. And then, you know, with internet news blowing up, okay, writing um, a web story versus having your video up there and just how, how all those different um, ways of communication are really merging into one and as it continues to merge and evolve. And when I went into my first job, I knew way more about all these different platforms than my coworkers did who had been in journalism and been doing this for years just because I was kind of learning you know what it was what the cutting edge technology that was and and oh yeah I can write a press release oh I can write a newspaper story oh I can take pictures oh I can do all of this I can write social media posts and I know how to do all of them well which was something that my my other peers in my job uh, could not do so that was very very valuable at the time I thought I can't learn how to do all of this and keep them all straight but then when you're actually applying it into your job, you realize it put you at a huge advantage. How about experiences outside of the classroom? What kinds of things did you get involved in? Christine's mentioned um, AdFed. We've heard a little bit maybe about Tommy Media, study abroad, I know many of you did. Um, talk a little bit about how those experiences contributed to who you are today. Um, I, I would just say I was a big Tommy Media guy when I was here, and I'm still a big supporter of it. I I think in terms of getting practical experience, um, you're going to get a lot of it. It's, it's not exactly hard-hitting news every single day, but it was just the fact that I was around words every day, that I was doing something with photos every day, that I was around media and journalism because, especially for reporters, as I'm sure someone like Pauline can tell you, words is you're around it every single day, uh, almost every moment of your day. Um, you're dealing with words and writing and putting together a story and thinking about the mechanics of a story. And so, just getting that initial phases of that under my belt and doing that on a regular basis really gave me a good foundation for when I had to go do it in the workforce. Yeah, before Tommy Media was Campus Scope. So <laughs> Carrie Jo was one of my anchors when it was my senior year. Um, Campus Scope was a monthly television show that we would work to put together. Um, so after that dissolved along with the Aquin, we, a lot of us up here, were kind of right in the middle of it. And so we had to bridge broadcast writing with um, paper writing and then Probably one of the best advices a student had ever given to me was to take all of your production classes as early as possible, finish them as soon as possible, and then use the rest of your time in college to perfect your craft. So that's what I did. And that's when Tommy Media came in such, such a perfect time because Tommy Media really gave you that almost as close as it gets for a college student, that real world experience because that's what I do is I, I write for the web I do a video story, I have to update Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that fun stuff, and I do that on a daily basis. And there are some times with Tommy Media, we had daily turns. And so that was a great way to get practice in where you didn't have to worry about a grade. 
you didn't have to worry about getting an A or you know passing the class. It was where you can really tr try something new, and then you had great advisors or great student peers that can look over your work and give you different ideas on how to do things. And then you take that, you take what you learned in your classes, and you take what you've built on it through something like Tommy Media, and then you take it to your internships, and you keep building on that, and you get advice from your mentors who have been in this business for a long time. You build on that, and you build on that through all of all of your experiences, and then you take that to your first job, and you keep building on it. It's never really ending, really, because you can always learn something new. Um, yeah, I'll just elaborate a little bit more on um, the National Student Advertising Competition, because, um, yeah, like I, I said uh, earlier, I had no idea how um, actually helpful it would be for me. Um, because, I mean, it's kind of like the blind leading the blind um, in there, aside from our wonderful seeing eye dogs, um, Purdy and um, Craig Bryan. But uh, it, it's just like a bunch of us trying to figure out um, how to use a hundred million dollar budget for Nissan with very minimal information um, and spread that across a campaign, which we have no idea like how to do anything because we're students. Um, but I have to say, uh, through that whole process of taking a year to work with um, work with the people in your group to um, create this book at the end um, and a presentation that shows your idea um, and sells it through, tries to sell it through well, and then to get to present it to a client in front of an auditorium of people, um, I could not have guessed that it would have been that accurate to what I actually do um, when it comes to new business pitches. Um, it really is. They only you know, they issue an RFP, um, and you you know send information, and then if they say like yes, like come be part of the um, circus, then you go into a room with a bunch of people and put together a plan that you want to sell through. Um, so I couldn't have asked for a better experience there, especially the presentation part, because um, you know like you were saying, uh, the presentation qualities in like all of the different Kojo classes I took, as well as um, NSAC and AdFed, uh, so invaluable to what I do today because it's all the time presentations. I would just add to that um, you probably hear at nauseum about internships and how important they are, and I will say that that's absolutely true. Um, and you're at a huge advantage just given the location of St. Thomas Dean and St. Paul. You think about people that are going to be competing for jobs against you from out-state schools and nothing against their education. I mean, obviously, St. Thomas is the best, but um, <laughs> you have countless nonprofits, countless companies, countless agencies around you, um, and St. Thomas has, like, the best job boards. People are constantly coming and finding jobs that are not coming out here. But um, that aside, I think one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was a student, when I sort of, you know, I was involved in DECA in high school, so I was like, marketing, okay, that seems cool. Like, I like people. I like selling stuff, um, you know, that m seems to make sense. I'm decent at communication, so I kind of pursued that path pretty quickly, but the world of marketing is massive, and there's so many different tacks that you can hear. Um, just that it's really related to journalism as well, but um, was to just start with your passions. So for me, that was, you know, volunteering um, at a local nonprofit here, Friends of the Orphans, just around the corner. Um, I just kind of walked into the office and was like, hey, like, I'm into your mission, I think it's cool. Like, how can I take what I'm learning in school right now? I was like a freshman or a sophomore and like help you guys out. Um, so of course it was like non unpaid and like not a lot of um, time during the week, but I would just go in and like say, you know, can I help write some stuff for you guys? Or can, have you thought about doing this? And like, I don't know, it was just kind of a low pressure way to like m enter into the world of what eventually like looks like an internship. Um, so outside of classwork, I think that's a really important thing. And I know there's still Business 200 here where you're doing volunteer work, um, but to be able to start to apply some of those skills in a low pressure situation or in a situation where you have kind of that safety net, um, I think is a really smart way to go and kind of be able to take the pressure off. <laughs> this tank of a building, you can't get Siri in here. Um, I, I Once I realized I want to go to law school, I didn't seek out a ton of externships or internships off of campus, but I did take uh, advantage of a few things. One being Tommy Media, which people have already talked about. It was a great experience, and I got to do a lot of cool projects and spend a lot of time honing my writing skills and editing skills, and that I cannot say enough how much that's paid off. 
uh, in my current position. Um, I also was a participant in the undergraduate communication research, research conference where I got to present one of my papers I had written for a class. Um, so outside of that process of actually doing research and, and you know, coming up with an argument and writing it all down, I got to take the time to condense that into a few PowerPoint slides, um, spend 15 minutes uh, basically presenting everything I had learned um, to a relatively small audience, but it was, it was still a good time and a great experience um, just in public speaking and preparing presentations. And then you, Dr. White mentioned study abroad and I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't support that 100%. Uh, no matter what you end up doing, try and study abroad while you're here at St. Thomas. They have an incredible program. Uh, no matter where you go, what class you take, you're gonna have a, a wonderful experience. So I'll ask one more question, but start thinking about the questions you wanna ask because it's almost time. So we've talked a lot about your Kojo experience and, and the, all the things that you did in Kojo to help get you where you are, but are there other things that you did outside of Kojo? So other classes that you took or other things you were involved in, um, things from your, from your core uh, education experience that, that you would really like to pass along to our current students as something to think about? Well, I double minored. So I double minored in Renaissance, which is kind of like general business. And then I double minored in poly political science, which came in so much handy because my first job was in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And when I came, that was right after Act 10 with Governor Scott Walker. So then he was in the midst of being recalled. So when I got there, they were handing in the ballots. He was getting recalled. So then we had the elections for the recall. And then the ones who got recalled, we had to you know have primaries and then have elections for those seats. And then it was like all these things. So to have that double to have that minor, it really came in handy because obviously I had so much politics to deal with and I still have so much politics to deal with because I'm still in Wisconsin, but you know. Um, but in any case, if I were to suggest if you're into broadcast journalism, political science is always a good minor to have. I, uh, when I graduated in 2011 and instead of going and getting a job right away, uh, the summer after I graduated, I got an internship at the St. Paul Pioneer Press. And the reason I wanted to do that um, was because at the time I was huge into sports journalism and I knew or I thought I knew that's what I wanted to do. But I knew that uh, my news judgment wasn't as sharp as I would have liked it to be. And so I got an internship at the Pioneer Press as a news intern. And that was so beneficial because I learned just a lot of fundamentals about journalism. I learned how to cover breaking news, how to, I did everything from like covering a car crash to learning how to cover a city council meeting to covering the funeral of a Marine. And it was just very powerful learning experiences. And I'm so glad that I actually took the time to attack something that I thought was a weakness of mine because in the long run, it made me way more well-rounded and way more marketable when I actually went out in the job force to go out and, and get a job in the industry. So if you, if you think you have ways that you can sort of attack your weaknesses or focus on improving those things, I highly suggest you to do that. Any other campus-wide activities or other department sorts of things? Let's take a different path. I, uh, did, I was in choir, concert choir, uh, for all my four years and, um, it was wonderful, and I highly recommend doing something in the arts on the side, um, because especially as things get crazy, 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 and you're presenting and putting together briefs and all these things, um, in especially towards your senior year, having time to uh, detach your brain and have to focus on something completely different, um, I think saved me. I feel bad about my earlier comment about Spanish. Um, <laughs> so I need to come back to that quick and just say that. Lo um, siento. Lo siento. No, um, I did and, you know, studied abroad and that was an amazing experience. Um, but I just think that that kind of gets at like the cultural exposure. Like I'm from the cities. I love the cities. I still live here. I own a home here and I like don't see myself ever leaving. But um you know, even just taking those Spanish courses really opened my eyes to different cultures. And then obviously going to Spain and Morocco was like just incredible just to be able to really expand my 
perspective. Um, and I think there were other courses too, you know, from philosophy to other kind of um, courses kind of in that realm. I, I definitely wish I would have taken more kind of arts classes or, but you know, with a major and a double minor, it's a little tough to fit in some other types of things. But um, I would definitely just advocate for doing something that feels a little out of your comfort zone or feels um, like it will definitely expand your perspective or your culture, even if it's at going to a couple of club meetings or um, that seems sort of random and you have no intention of going back again. But um, it's just such an awesome time during college to really, um, you know, you don't have the pressure of your job. You don't have the um, time constraints of that. You can just really kind of dabble. And I think that was um, through my wonderful Spanish courses. That was a benefit that I gained. I think kind of going off of that, I was a psychology minor, um, and it was just, it was kind of a nice way to escape a little bit from the world of journalism, because you can get really bogged down by it with, with daily assignments and really trying to master that craft, um, especially when you're like, the more I work at it, the better I'll get. So to kind of have that, that second area of study that you could do almost for fun, you know, it's just a way to kind of expand your mind. That's the beauty of, of going to a liberal arts college. Um, and on top of that, anybody heard of the vision program through campus ministry? Yes. So I was a student leader um, three years in college, and that was by far the most formidable experience of my college career. Um, so we take service trips during J term and then over spring break. And um, I think it just broadened my perspective and broadened my horizons in every way of um, meeting classmates and meeting people from all walks of life, traveling to different places, um, and really applying everything that I've learned um, to them and vice versa. Um, that just kind of built me up as a person. And I remember coming back from each and every trip being better than I was before, being more confident than I was before to apply to my studies, you know, really knowing who I am, what I want, what I don't want, and then being able to go forward from that. And really, by the time I graduated, I finally knew who I was. So this is kind of a plug for vision in a way, um, but really it was just a really great experience. Um, it allowed you to, it allowed you to travel like study abroad does, but it allowed you to kind of go outside your comfort zone and to challenge yourself to not bring your cell phone with you for a month and to just really focus on who you are as a person, especially during this time in your life when you're trying to answer that question every single day and you'll continue to try to answer that question every single day for the years to follow. Um, but it was a great way to keep yourself grounded and really dig deep and find out who you are. Do you still play ultimate frisbee, Brian? I started the ultimate frisbee team while I was here. Wow. It's I like recess. I remember it well. And that's important. I named that team. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's a legend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my hair was down to here, and um, I was thinking of one of the most valuable things I took out of college was starting to create my professional sounding board. Um, I think it's important, no matter what career path uh, you have, to have a few uh, friends and mentors who will keep you in check and who you can go to when you have questions. Um, creating a relationship with a faculty member that you can go to about your own career path throughout it is really relevant. If you can leave college with that um, type of mentor, um, and also a few friends that you can go to and vent about work and talk about your job, how well or bad it's going. Um, a healthy social life does um, create very important relationships. And when I look back at my college experience, some of the most valuable things I have are a core of good people who help take care of me and who mutually I do that for them too. So you can do that in any major. But um, that should be a goal, is to leave. What's that? Yeah, we are, because we communicate well. Um, we set expectations. But um, to be able to leave with a few people who will help you for the next 30 years as you find a career you love and that allows you to grow is really, really important. So. Yeah, I, I just want to echo that. I've made several career decisions, and I haven't made one without consulting three or four people, and most of them have been from St. Thomas. Actually, I don't know if any of them have not been from St. Thomas. So what he said was huge. Definitely start to just foster and develop those relationships as soon as you can, because it, it, you'll probably use them in the long run. 
My wife was a Kojo major. <laughs> she works at a marketing a firm in Minneapolis. Yeah, we have a six-week-old baby. And a Kojo here. baby. He came. To... <laughs> um, this is just a little bit interesting that just dawned on me that my two closest colleagues at work um, happen to be Tommies. So I'll just say that. But I mean, I would 100% agree that um, this is an amazing community. And certainly, if you stay in the cities, um, there will be Tommies around you. They will find you. You will find them. Um, and it's just awesome to know that you sort of were exposed to such a great education, but also a very similar mindset, just good people. And I think that's just no matter yeah, your, your discipline, that that's something that you, sh you should feel really good about. And it is totally in the German community's place. We like to joke that there's actually like a number of Tommies and also Suzanis at my agency. Obviously, we're superior, but they do exist. We the, can be friends. The paper I was at or the company I was at had a several St. Thomas people who, St. Thomas graduates who they'd hired as reporters. And our company had sort of a high rate of turnover. And somebody would always come and ask me, you got any St. Thomas friends? Are there, are there more St. Thomas people? Because we love hiring them. So, yeah. What questions do you all have? And I see professors in the room, too, so they can ask questions that they have on their mind. Raise your hand high. All right, cool. Here I come. Uh, this question is more towards um, those of you who are attorneys, but I guess any of you. Um, as undergrads, did you ever participate in a mock trial program at St. Thomas at all? I think I attended one mock trial meeting, uh, and for whatever reason. Yeah, it might have been for the free pizza. Uh, but no, I didn't do that uh, when I was here. It wasn't something that really occurred to me ever. And then once I did decide that I was going to law school, one of my friends who was also uh, had known for a while was like, hey, you should come to a mock trial thing. I just never got into it, but that'd be a great experience. Okay, um, I guess then I'm gonna uh, broaden my question a little bit. What kind of um, clubs did you do that you remember that were not related to Kojo at all, but really made an impact on you? I mean, it's kind of similar to the, what we just discussed, but I don't know. I was in ski and snowboard club. That was pretty fun. <laughs> Brent, what did you did you get involved in any other clubs? Outside uh, of well, I wasn't in, involved in mock trial, and I'm trying to think of what other clubs outside of Tommy Media or what other like organizations I was involved with, and nothing really comes to mind outside of just like sports and, and that kind of thing. But um, something I was going to say earlier, in a roundabout way, uh, I was a print journalism major that kind of transitioned into Kojo with like an emphasis in print journalism, um, and in an unintentional way because I decided so late on in my journalism career uh, that I wanted to go to law school. It was, uh, it happened to be almost like the perfect major for law school and the practice of law. Um, for the writing skills that Grant talked about and, ev and everybody's kind of talked about, um, reporting skills are like a perfect transition to the fact finding that you uh, undertake in, in any kind of lawsuit. Um, obviously, oral communication skills are huge too. Um, so I'm not sure I can speak directly to like a club or something like that, but in a weird roundabout way, um, print journalism or Kojo was like the perfect major. And if I went back, I'd honestly, knowing that I was going to go to law school, I'd still major in print journalism. And I, I think there's a pre-law society that you can join to, and I'm sure there's debate teams and all that would be great experiences. There's also tons of classes. I know Kojo has a media law class. That's one of the first things I took where I was like, okay, this is kind of what I want to do. And then I started taking a, you know, business law classes. I did a minor in philosophy and took logic and argumentation classes. And all those are great ways to, um, just to help prepare yourself. All right. Oh, up next, Deb. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, I know that in the field of communication journalism, we're always dealing with people. And uh, I can speak for a number of, of students in my class, but um, sometimes that can be a little bit intimidating. So say that uh, we have a, like an interview story come out, uh, coming up soon. Uh, for us, the situation is pretty friendly. I mean, we're just students. But I know that there are situations that are a little bit heavier where you have to deal with people. Um, uh, I can't think of one right now. but. So say something like more serious. Uh, 
do you have any advice on how to just be approachable in that situation and how to be at ease when it comes to interacting with people in those difficult stories? Um, I not, I don't know that I'm going to answer your question necessarily from like a story perspective, but one of the things that I deal with um, frequently in my role as an account person with clients is um, really challenging scenarios. So for example, um, uh, a vice president of marketing is under a lot of pressure any, all, at all times in terms of um, needing to prove their budgets and the work that their teams are doing to meet certain goals to, you know, someone like their CEO or um, others on their executive team. And for whatever reason, marketing and communications activities tend to be more scrutinized, it seems like, than any other area. And so there, seem, there can be some really tense scenarios in which you know, I'm put in a situation where I need to basically sell in the work that we're doing to someone who is fearful for their job or fearful that their company is not going to get um, you know, well positioned to be sold. Or you know, there's a very business-oriented um, uh, repercussions, very serious repercussions that uh, come down to the right way to communicate the work that you're doing um, in a high pressure situations. Um, on the other side of that, from a client relations perspective, there can be um, times where, you know, the client's not happy. The work missed the mark. Um, the results were bad. And as an account person, your responsibility is to defend the work, but also be a good listener and understand and accept where maybe things fell down um, in a way that doesn't lose the business. So, I mean, those are a couple of just kind of off the cuff examples where it's scary and your gut is like turning and um, you really have to kind of problem solve around how to best uh, mitigate kind of that situation. From watching Just Do This um, for a good two years, I will say that it does come down a lot to listening and how good she is at just like taking it in, all the information and like, you know, eye contact, making sure they hear you um, and you hear them. And then um, just responding in a honest way um sometimes you don't know the answer and that's okay and for the most part humans uh like honesty and um i don't know i just think she's really good at her job i will echo that just being human remember to be human you have you have a title obviously when you go out you're a pr person you're a reporter you're you're whatever you are but don't forget to be human i talk to people all the time i interview people all the time whether it's Packers players or it's police officers or it's a mother who lost their daughter because she was shot randomly in the light of day, whatever it is. Um, I sometimes I just start off just asking, you know, how is your day? And really, when you ask that, listen to their answers and respond genuinely. Don't just ask just to ask and just pretend to make conversation. Really ask. Um, if you're on a heavier topic, say a serious, more, more serious topic, like someone who just lost a loved one in a car crash or whatever else it is, you know, just ask them how they're doing and really listen. Listening is a key thing. Christine said, listen. Um, and I never, I don't normally say, you know, I know how you feel because you don't. Even if you have a similar experience, you don't technically know because everyone experiences things differently. So it's just all about listening and just really caring when you ask your questions, you know. And you might be surprised if you're talking to someone who, you know, just lost a loved one some things that make them smile are the happiest memories of that person. And they'll want to tell you all the things about them. And you just, you sit there and you listen. And you listen and you smile when they smile. And then you just, you are sincere. It's probably the easiest way. Hopefully that helps. I think one thing that, um, that I've noticed, I, I do the same thing as Pauline. I interview people all the time and I get them to answer those really hard questions. I ask the hard questions. I want to make them cry. If I make someone cry, and when I'm asking them, then I do my job well, which sounds really backwards, but it's true. Um, but I think what, something that's really important is just to have, if you respect them, they'll respect you. Um, and that's really hard to do sometimes, but sometimes it takes you um, kind of what, echoing what these guys are saying is you're a person too. And there's been a few times um, I was interviewing a man who was homeless and I walked in and I did not pretend to be better than him. I came in with no judgments at all. When he was on the floor, I sat on the floor. When he was sitting outside in, in 20 degree weather, I sat outside with him. I totally was on his level. And because of that, he opened up to me. I wasn't just this chick who strolled in trying to expose him for everything that he is and everything he's not. 
I was just a person trying to hear his story. And the more, the, uh, the more he was able to just break down his walls and trust me, the better the story was. And we both left. I gave him a hug. He gave me a hug. We shared tears together. That's the other hard part is he starts crying and I'm like, try not to cry with him. Um, but when you have that mutual respect, then they feel it too. Um, and I think that's, that's, the, that's the best that you can do. And I think it's okay to cry too. I've cried too when I've interviewed people. It's okay to cry because you're human. So often we used to think that journalists were, you know, this person that was so far away and they were just kind of unbiased and they were just or some person who asked the questions and whatever else. But you have to remember that you're human. I've cried before because it's emotional. It's an emotional story. And then that's how you connect with them. So I think just to throw in, um, anytime there's a challenging situation, one of the hardest parts to do is remove bias. It's impossible. It always is there. But the more um, professionally, the more self-aware you can become of how you approach situations, how you communicate with people, and um, take that in to your given situation, the challenging person you're talking to, um, you're going to be better off for it. That quest to become self-aware and know um, the biases that exist inside you, no matter how hard you work, um, will make you a better professional. Um, but it's always a challenge, and it's something that's never, never done. Okay, so my question is, knowing what you know right now, especially with COVID in the loop, what are some things you wish you'd learned during your undergraduate years, um, whether that be in classrooms or like social media? Personally, I wish, so the company I work for now is, it's a dig digital marketing agency, um, as well as video production. I'm one of two people on the video production side, so I'm you know kind of off my own side, but everything that goes around in my office is all marketing. And it's been so interesting how the world of marketing and social and PR and video and everything is just all merging into one world. And I'm kind of, I'm on the outside of everything, so I don't have to know it, but at the same time, I'm learning on the fly of how it works. And then, it, it, like I said, it's evolving all of the time. And I think about that all the time is I wish I would have taken some sort of marketing class to just see now how it applies to everything that you guys are still doing in journalism. If that's one thing. Just a quick one. What you'll need to know six years from now doesn't exist yet. When I started, my first year professionally, we had a meeting and we sat down and we talked about Facebook. We didn't know what it was. It was just being introduced to the university. That was nine years ago. So that's not a long time. And now it's not even cool. So what, just be prepared for that, I guess. There are things that you probably should know, but they don't exist yet. <laughs> so just be prepared for that change. That being said, there are some skills that are all, always important. We've talked a lot, enough about writing. I wish I would have taken five more editing classes because there's still things I just don't understand. I also wish I, wish I would have done a lot more public speaking, whether that's in class or just like don't, like through any avenue doing that. I still get nervous when I have to talk in court in front of people, um, and just more, the more experience you get with things like that, the more comfortable it's, it's going to be down the line. You had asked to, um, I think I heard you say, professionally and or school-wise and socially, what you wish you would have known, and I think um, we've talked about just the importance of the relationships built at St. Thomas, both with students and other and faculty members, and I just think um, I don't know if I knew this for sure at the time, but um, certainly not well as, as well as I, I wish I would have, just that, um, just to trust yourself and, and know that the relationships that you're building are, truly have the potential to be your lifelong family. Like I'm still, my, my family friends are all friends from St. Thomas, and um, I think there feels this pressure to have a really wide um, group of like tons of friends and it's awesome to be acquaintances with a lot of different people it expands your horizons and all that awesome stuff but like don't be afraid to have like a few relationships that you really invest yourself in um my friend Allison likes to talk about how like scientifically you can only have seven real relationships in your life and that does include friends and family and so she totally would she was on the fall panel by the way I don't know if any of you guys are here but um I think about that a lot because you get stretched in a lot of directions and you're so busy and you're running all around and like I just remember thinking back in school, like this kind of pressure to like maintain all these friendships and that kind of just spill over from high school maybe, but 
um, just don't be afraid to like really invest in the people that you align with in terms of your values that um, potentially are in the same field as you are and, and really just kind of focus on those relationships. We could take maybe one or two more questions and I thought we could, um, we could stop and, and maybe give you a chance to talk one-on-one -on -one for a few minutes with the panelists if they're willing to stay. Okay, um, my question, I want to know um, from a few of you, especially Pauline, because you're kind of in the career path that I want to get into. What do you think is the most important step or the most important decision you made, either in college or post-college, to get to the career that you're in? Most important step, I would say, um, I kept in contact with people. A lot of times in internships, people will say, oh yeah, keep in touch. But then it's so intimidating because you're like, how often do I keep in touch? How many emails do I send? What do I do? What do I say? What do I do? Um, but when they say that to you, do it. Because those are the people who are going to tell you when there's a job opening. Those are the people who are going to say, oh, yes, you can use me as a reference on your resume, even though you, know, you were only here for a few months for an internship. Those kind of things. I think that was like the best thing that I did was I actually, I did throughout all four internships, there was a set group of people including faculty as well as other internships that I had previous that I would send an email to maybe once every two, three months. And I just update them on what I've learned, um, how it's similar to say what I learned at class or maybe in the other internship experience and things like that so that they know, yes, I still exist and you still need to remember me, remember me, that type of thing, so. I completely agree with that. And I was just gonna say, I know I made a comment like this before, but after, um, after getting hired for my first job, I didn't actually look for another job. I had people who said, hey, you should check this out. Hey, you'd be good at this. Hey, I think you'd make a good candidate for this. And most of, actually all of them were St. Thomas people. And the reason I, I worked down in the basement of OEC and the reason I heard about this job is because someone reached out to me and said, hey, I think you'd be good for this. And so just piggybacking off of what Pauline said, again, foster those relationships and develop them because, again, they could come back around in ways that you would never imagine. And they might not respond to you, but that's okay. Just keep writing them <laughs> consistently once every, you know, few months. Don't bombard them every single week, but, you know, once every few months is good. I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's kind of how everything started off for me was um, obviously keeping in touch with people throughout the years, but um, also just not being afraid to step out and um, just because no one else in your group, friend group, class is deciding to um, step forward and meet the person coming to speak or um, giving your information to someone in the, who's a professional, um, you should do it. Um, because, uh, I mean, for, for me, I was, uh, I sent an email to one of the first Advent speakers, I think, that came in. I was so excited. Um, and, because uh, he was like, come on, come on, like, every, make sure you email me or whatever. And um, so I was like, oh, I guess I will. And I sent him an email. I'm like, I probably got 30 emails. So I was in the back and whatever. And um, he's like, no, no one emailed me but you. Um, which I was, that was my first, like, oh, I'm blown away. I thought everyone was as excited as I was. Um, and so, that was kind of my first, um, like I said, weird internship, but um, the, probably the best experience I could have had at that age as a sophomore because, um, I mean, all those people now work at some of the best shops in the country, in the world. Um, so uh, I just stick your neck out there and um, don't be afraid to say hi and follow up with people and take their time. Kind of picking up, picking Going off of that, <laughs> what time is it? Um, going off of that, and to probably answer your question for Pauline, Pauline was a year younger than me. Look at your eyes, I'm like, what do you want to tell? <laughs> Pauline was a year younger than me, um, but she was um, she was a leader of Campus Scope at the time. And I remember looking at her going, but you're younger than me, and you have a leadership role. And she pushed me to be better, because I knew, she knew herself so well, she knew what she wanted, she knew what she was good at, and she knew if I wanted to get better at this, I need to apply it, I want this experience, I'm gonna go for it. And she led people that are that were one, two, three years older than her, and look where she is at now. 
she took that step in saying, no, I'm good enough at this. I know I can do this and I'm going to, and I'm going to kick butt at it. And I mean, I listened, I paid attention. <laughs> Carrie Jo was very good. She says she was so intimidated in front of the camera, but she was so good at anchoring. I totally thought that she was going to be a reporter with me. Totally no thought it. <laughs> <laughs> but really it was, it was that courage to just say, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I don't care if I'm the youngest person in the room, I want to try it. And she did great at it. So it's just, it's just sticking your neck out there and just, just going for it because you have nothing to lose. That's another thing is make mistakes now because you have, you can afford it. You have people here, you have mentors to help you, both professors and your own classmates. Um, there's stuff that I created when I was in school. I look back and say, can I burn that? It was awful. Why did I write that? Why did I shoot that that way? Why did I think I was so good at that? Like, that's awful. But you can make, you can make those mistakes now because now, looking back on that, I, I've learned from that. And now I have learned to expound on that and be better at it and be better at it every day. What Carrie Jo hasn't mentioned is the summer, or the semester before I was the producer of Campus Scope was my first ever experience in anything journalism. So Campus Scope was obviously a television show and I had no experience in high school. So I literally, I went to the meetings, but I just sat and I just listened because I was so intimidated of people. But then I was like, okay, so if I really want to do this, I got to at least give it a shot. So I found a good friend, Ashley Bolcom, who's now the 10 p.m. producer at Fox 9 here in the Twin Cities. She and I were like connected at the hip and we did every single thing together because we were, we understood each other. So if you find those good friends, again, making those relationships, you have someone who's going through the same experiences as you are. And college is kind of what you make of it. It's what you put in is what you get out. And it's the same thing with internships. So now is the time where you try new things, you experience, as, you experience what you like and what you don't like, and then that will form what you do in the future, I would say. That sounds like a great ending comment for the larger group. Um, just one quick order of business. So for all the panelists, I've got parking coupons <laughs> and video release forms <laughs> in room 122 and a little parting gift. Uh, but on, on behalf of, of everyone in Kojo, the faculty, I want to thank you so much for coming and giving your time. You, are, you make us so proud. I'm going to cry now. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's, I mean, for them to take time out of their really busy lives and babies and driving across Wisconsin and, and work and all this kind of stuff is terrific. And um, we hope some of you will be up here in you know, a couple years sharing your advice. So please join me in, in thanking them. <laughs>